Silence Breaker Films' first feature, Tales from Nowhere, was a story about the lives of a group of young people who lived on a council estate in Rotherham. It worried a few people in high places because of how it portrayed the town. Domestic violence, assault, robbery, heroin addiction. It raised a lot of questions. Now we're going to try and find the answers. For centuries, Rotherham's chapel on the bridge provided a place of prayer for those crossing the River Don. It's one of only a few across the country and has been used to attract tourists and favourable write-ups. In recent years though, the only times Rotherham's had a mention in the media has been to call it the teenage pregnancy capital of Europe or the heroin abuse capital of Britain, or for being last in South Yorkshire figures for residents with qualifications. Tales from Nowhere's portrayal of life in the town then seemed to be a reflection of reality. And when the film was first shown in Sheffield, people from Rotherham approached us saying we showed how bad things really were. But why was it like this? We went into Rotherham and asked the people themselves. Well, it's gone down a lot, hasn't it? But it was steaming. Why do you think that's people are out of jobs? Right. Do you think that's made things a bit worse as well? Yeah, yes. I mean, my, my son used to work as an electrician down the pit. We see it closed. Coal, steel. Right. But, but they're the main two industries. Well, they used to be. Right. So it's changed a lot now because all the uh, pits of the world is closed down now. Right. Um, so I think they're the traditional ones. Mining and steel. Mining and steel. Yeah. Right. Victims of the rotten policies of the last 20 years of government. You know, we've got no youth clubs, there's no jobs, kids go on the streets, you know, through desperation, kids take drugs. There's no mining, no steel, no engineering, no nothing, it's just coal centres. It's all gone, it's coal, coal centres. Um, Hits have gone. Yeah, everything's gone. Steel's gone. Mining probably. Mining? What's mining got to do with it? Well, the people of Rotherham were for decades supported by the steel and coal industries, until relatively recently. And since the job losses, they've been told to get over it. We've had films like The Full Monty and Brassed Off, and several documentaries on the subject of the redundant steel workers and miners. The rest of Britain seems sick of hearing about it. And so the area has tried to get over it. The people have struggled together to recover. But now, maybe more than ever, They've been fighting against the odds.
In 1983, there were around 10,000 people employed in the coal mines of Rotherham. By the turn of the millennium, there were less than a thousand. The effects of this were obviously inevitably devastating. With unemployment on the increase, with it came poverty and crime. But why did it happen? This is Nick Howard, who, whilst the industry was still thriving, taught miners in classes of industrial studies at the University of Sheffield. It was during this time he found out about a report written by Conservative Party MP Nicholas Ridley, which stated that in order to remove workers' rights and put profit before people, the strong miners' unions had to be destroyed. Well, the Ridley, the Ridley report, it was um, leaked to one of the businessmen's papers, The Economist, uh, well before the strike. In fact, it was put into a, it was put into a discussion group of the newly elected ministers of the Margaret Thatcher government, um, I think in early 1980. And um, what, it, what it talked about was breaking the back of trade union power as part of the policy of privatising the whole of the state sector of British industry. And uh, it was a largely nationalised sector, the railways, the electricity supply, the coal mines, the steel. Um, so there was a there was a, a, a vast area of uh, the infrastructure, the main the main uh, heavy industrial base of, uh, of, of Britain's economy, which was state owned and state controlled, and they wanted to break this completely, uh, either sell it off and privatise it, or or make it vulnerable to uh, competition from oil, competition from natural gas, competition from coal from Australia. They were willing to bring in coal from Australia or Poland or Colombia rather than use the coal that British miners had uh, dug out for centuries. So it was a, it was a radical right-wing document which contemplated taking on the entire trade union sector um, and making them pay for what they wanted to do. In other words, making the workers unemployed or accept really atrocious working conditions as part of their strategy, because I don't think any of the employers would have uh, lost a lot of money in the process. So, uh, eventually they, they bought out a lot of the assets at bargain prices. So it, it, it was a document really uh, declaring war. And if you look at the details of it, it even called for squads of mobile police who would be bussed around from uh, site to site to deal with uh, mass picketing or flying pickets. Uh, but they brought them, they, you, they wouldn't use, they didn't want to use local policemen because they might have relatives who worked in the pits who would show sympathy for the, uh, the villages that were under, the coal mining villages that were under attack. So they brought them in from Warwickshire and from Dorsetshire and from Cornwall, you know, they brought, they brought them from far away. Um, we think never been actually proved that they also brought in some trainee soldiers, you know, and put them into police, policemen's uniforms. They also prepared a, a kind of a propaganda onslaught on the miners. And we think that the um, military intelligence, so-called MI5, had a hand in that. So they put spies into the union, um, or they tapped the telephone numbers of the union officials so that they knew where picketing was going to take place would always say we need a huge stockpiles of coal and uh, I think I think the 
Union probably underestimated the amount of coal that was in stock. Something like probably a year's production of coal already stopped. You know, so you could say, well, that's more than a coincidence, isn't it? Because that's how long the strike lasted. And uh, at one point, people were calling for desperate measures. Instead of turning the lights off, they said, turn the lights on. You know, let's use all the electricity we can. <laughs> Try and burn up all the coal as fast as we can. But really, the strike depended on the support of other unions. Because to organize a confrontation with a government, with a state, when it's bringing in squads of policemen, um, when it's using telephone tapping and you know, uh, employing spies in the union and uh, using almost paramilitary methods of breaking pickets, stopping people from moving along the roads. Miners in Kent who wanted to come up and join the strikes in Yorkshire or Nottinghamshire were refused permission to go through the tunnel under the Thames that, that links Kent to the rest of the country. I mean, there were people were stopped um, in their cars, just driving along, you know. Anywhere in South Yorkshire, you, any mine, group of miners in a car would, would be uh, pulled to the side by um, police cars and, and told that was it. They were going to be arrested, you know. I mean, no law allowed the state to do that, but they, they did it all the time. And they were accused of um, organising riots and disorder. And when the strike ended, there was a huge trial in Sheffield that miners were accused of um, fomenting a riot. A riot's a very serious charge, you know. You, you go to jail probably for three years for that. But, uh, but they brought all these uh, miners into court after the strike was over. Um, there were a lot of men during the strike were charged and, and put in prison, you know. And, and because they got criminal records, never got their jobs back. You know, there was wholesale use of the law. The other aspect of it was the attempt by the state, and it was, uh, it, it was effective for a short while, um, was actually sequester the funds of the union. The banks would simply say, we're locking up your money, you know. You've got your cash in our bank, but we've been instructed to close the account and deny you access to it. And it was methods like this that make it quite amazing that the strike went on as long as it did. This is Armthorpe, near Doncaster, where I grew up. Twenty years ago, these pavements were stained with the blood of protesting miners. The most infamous of all the confrontations, though, was what is now known as the Battle of Orgreave. Journalist Phil Turner was there. Well, I mean, the image that always comes to mind is the sort of mass ranks of the police, and then what you don't see from the media coverage is, you know, the behaviour of the police, which, uh, not so much in Orgreave, but on other people's lines, would be, you know, the waving the pay packets to sort of wind miners up. Um, and, you know, the boasting about how they pay for the mortgages. That's an element. But also the, 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 the violence, you know, and the, the way they were tooled up. They were, you know, they'd use horses, they'd got all the riot gear. And on the other hand, you saw miners who, um, you know, um, might, because there was no other way of doing anything, throw a few stones. When it's then you would see, you know, skulls being cracked. Miners being beaten to a pulp. You know, I've seen the pictures. I've seen it with my own eyes. And miners simply, really, being criminalised for fighting back, fighting for their jobs, and doing the only thing they can is to organise together. Being uh, attacked by the police. You, you I, saw that. Yeah. I've, I've never seen a miner go straight up to a policeman or a policewoman and hit them, punch them in the face. But I've seen it the other way around. The, the police did that. Police did that. Yeah. And you see the miners in their t-shirts, shorts, and uh, uh, pumps, you know, being attacked by by uh, police who were organised, drafted in, being billeted in their thousands in RAF camps nearby, being paid around the clock, and you know, all the best of everything. Uh, on the other hand, you see miners who were virtually starving, um, being 
criminalised and uh, were uh, described by Thatcher as the enemy within. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's Thatcher and uh, the bosses who are the enemy within because they're the ones who are quite literally, uh, you know, making millions at our expense. The more uh, they get, the less we get. That's how it works. You know, and that was a reality which we never saw uh, on the TV screens and I think everybody knows now famously one bit of footage was, was re-round and re-edited to make it seem as if the miners had provoked uh, the police into attacking them, whereas in fact it had been the other way around. But what, what is it that we have to be suspicious about, about you know, why did they do that? Well I think it, it comes down to uh, their own interests, their own class interests, the people who run the media. Uh, certainly you know the Murdochs and people who are you know, multi-millionaires, that's what they call freedom of the press, a millionaire to uh, um, you know, pump out propaganda against workers like mine. Uh, and there were two uh, famous examples of print workers refusing to allow that to happen with the Sun and the Express, both coming, with, coming out with um, uh, um, blank pages or, or um, uh, editions being uh, black because of uh, print workers who've been supporting the miners, sending food, met the miners, come up to the, the soup kitchens and food kitchens, uh, identified with them so that they weren't prepared to let that happen. Miners in Rotherham at the Silverwood Pit were called scum of the earth. Now, you know, they were not prepared for that to happen, to allow that to happen, and um, it took uh, solidarity action to stop it. So I think you've got to look at it in terms of, you know, the BBC, ITV, they're all run by and mostly in the interest of uh, people who agreed with Thatcher. You know, ironically, you know, some of the richest people in this, in this country uh, who, you know, um, were prepared to sort of spit on miners and their families and just cast them into the darkness, really, and that's what they've done the last 20 years as more pits were closed. What happens next? People will survive. There's a lot of characters. This is Rotherham poet Roy Blackman, formerly the memory man of TV's The Sky's the Limit. At least we're not um, at least we're not dying from all these strange industrial diseases anymore. Yeah. And, uh, and that that's we that's an obvious cross. Yes, it gave us job. Yes, it gave us character. It killed us as well. You know, too many people who died too early from working in the steelworks. Yeah. With thousands of mining and steel jobs lost, Rotherham tried to get over it and put itself on the map by opening Magna, a former steelworks at Templeborough, converted into a museum and science adventure centre at the cost of £46 million. When it was a steelworks, providing important resources, the building employed 10,000 workers at its height. Magna created a couple of hundred jobs for people. Although to be fair, that's counting the people only and not the robots who work there. That's right, robots. Magna recruited robots in an attempt to attract tourists. But they seem to have become unhappy working there. The result? They tried to escape. <laughs> One of the things, one of the tasks of the Magna robots is that they can sense and follow light. So if you leave the door open and the robot switched on, not in the arena, uh, it's going to see the sunlight and head straight for it. It's just got simple infrared sensors. Right. So essentially all it did was drive it into the car park and somebody happened to come along and nearly run into it. And um, I didn't really think a lot of it and, and I was asked if, if they'd mind if they put the story, the, the car park, the car guy who, who drew, nearly drove into it. Uh, the Rotherham Star, which I think is an advertising newspaper, a little newspaper, and I thought it would do no harm for it to go in there. And so it went in there saying that you know, the robot had escaped. And the next day the Guardian rang me and then it was all over the world. I was being phoned from everywhere in the world and all the headlines were super intelligent robot makes a bid to escape from Magna. And, uh, I mean, you find various websites that talk about me as an evil genius who's using 
the uh, brains from flesh-eating eels to power my robots and things. I mean, things get a bit out of hand when they spread around. Right, because uh, uh, was it, uh, a similar incident happened with Flyborg, didn't it? Flyborg. This flying robot has been given the ability to react to its surroundings and learn from its experiences. I hired my grandson for his work experience from school and he and my, my technician had to carry the flyboard from the workshop to the main arena to, to display it. And when they got to the front door, there was a big gust of wind and it ripped the thing out of their hands. Now it left all the electronics in their hands and just blew away the balloon. So it was, it was only a big, big sort of balloon thing flying through the air, 14 foot balloon. But because of the size of it, the regulations are that we had to contact the airport services and tell them that it had blown away. And immediately the news got a hold of this, and uh, and we had another escape story, another another robot escapes from, from our uh, our place. But it, but the worst of it that was that there was a, I was interviewed by one. It was public television in Canada, and they'd completely got the wrong end of the stick, and they'd mixed up the flyboard with the predator and prey, and their story was that there was a super intelligent robot flying around England now attacking planes with a spike to try and suck out the battery power to keep firing itself to stay in the air. In spite of its attractions, Magna's geographical position, quite a distance outside the town centre, meant there weren't enough tourists. But at least it gave me a chance to play on the exhibitions. It was to do with funding. I mean, the, the, the thing, the pro there's a general problem with, uh, I've spoken to several of the Millennium Commissioned Museums, and they were such a brilliant idea, uh, but I think they were funded wrongly. What, what, what the Millennium Commission did was give all the funding away at once. So there was 50 million or, or whatever, something in the region of 50 million given to Magna, and there was millions given to lots of other ones like the Earth Centre, Think Tank in Birmingham and stuff. Uh, and that meant they could open a spectacular place with lots and lots of exhibitions. Uh, but then they, they run them for a year, and now the public want lots of new exhibitions but there's not the funding to do that. That costs a lot of money. And I think what people don't realise, I mean, they might complain, for instance, Magna and I, I don't know what Magna charges now, I think they were quite cheap to begin with. It's between five and seven pounds or something. Uh, but I sat down with some people once and worked out what was the actual cost of running, if, you know, to run Magna, what would it actually cost? And you'd have to be charging people about 25 pounds each or 30 pounds each, and they're not going to come. It's not worth their while. But the real cost of running these things, I mean, look at the size of magnets, a third of a mile long, you can't really heat it all. So, so the public are getting, I mean, they, sometimes somebody might complain, they don't really realise they're getting far more value for the money than they're actually paying. So the main problem is the running costs. And uh, Stephen Fieber, the first chief executive, was absolutely, I thought, brilliant, very, very creative, had really good ideas for a school of creativity and lots of things for the future. But the problem is that the money wasn't there to do it. And so eventually he had to be replaced by someone who was much more financially savvy, the, the marketing manager, Christine, who did a great job in getting Magna back in its feet. But she had to do it by going into corporate dues, you know, running, setting up lots of corporations, coming there for dinners. Magna's own website says it all. To continually develop the exhibition and ensure its visitor appeal, Magna needs to develop additional revenue streams from corporate partners and sponsors. Simply put, we need your help, and we have devised a variety of ways that your company can become involved in the Magna success story and receive an impressive array of reciprocal benefits. And so, Magna needed corporate sponsorships to keep going. These include Dyson, who recently garnered attention for firing almost a thousand British workers and shifting factories overseas, businessman Eddie Healy's stadium group, and Meadowhall. Meadowhall is Britain's most lucrative shopping complex, also built on land formerly occupied by steelworks. Like Magna, Meadowhall has provided jobs, but nowhere near the amount provided by the coal and steel industries before the 1980s. And not only does it pay less, but the majority of jobs in coal or steel were full-time, whilst retail jobs are mostly part-time. And when I asked Meadowall themselves just how many of the thousands of jobs there are unionised, they reacted like they didn't know what I was talking about. Yep, thanks to Margaret Thatcher and those like her, job stability has become an arcane thing of the past. Thatcher herself came to be considered an opponent of the arts, perhaps due to the way they raise questions. 
Under Thatcher's regime, funding into arts was cut, but they themselves struggled to fight back. And we Many arts workers in Rotherham have had to apply for lottery funds just to keep their own jobs. But then along came British Telecom. After they cut a deal with RMBC, the Arts Centre was forced to give its officers to BT, who started using them as a call centre, in return dealing with the council's communications for them. This unlikely partnership between a non-profit local government and a corporation has even been given a sickly name. RMBC and BT are known as RBT, or Rotherham Brought Together. Ugh. When I tried to get interviews with representatives from the Arts Centre, I was refused or ignored, and the rest of the workers there would only talk off camera and off the record, having been told not to discuss the deal with anyone. <laughs> Nonetheless, in spite of all this, there's still some art going on. This is singer Karen Mulcahy and guitarist Luke Pepper. They do the soundtracks for our films, the first being Tales From Nowhere. But we weren't even able to screen that film in Rotherham, the very town it was made in and about, because Rotherham hasn't had a cinema for about 15 years, even though everyone I talked to said they wanted one in the town. Yeah, I think if they don't get like, cinema and stuff, I think the future is it's going to get bigger and more people. Cause if you get a cinema, then more shops are going to come. And then it, you'll get a broader community coming round, so yeah. Do you think that Rotherham should have a cinema? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We've reminisced many times, haven't we, about how many closed? Yes, yeah. And then a lot of times closed. Uh, how many cinemas were there? Oh, well, there were cinema, hippodrome, there were regional theatre, the the Odeon, Empire, yeah. Whitehall. Now there isn't one? No. Would you, would you like to see another cinema? Yeah. Our audience was the best one, wasn't it? Where was that? Just the down that main street. Oh, right. Corporation Street. It's a bingo hall now. Right. But I think a lot of them have been turned into bingo halls. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's a shame. Yeah. Would you, because uh, when you go to see, do you ever go to see films at the cinema or anything like that? You don't yeah. now, we don't now. But you would if, if there was a cinema, yeah. you probably yes, would go. Yes, probably yeah. would. I don't know what, you should, what they don't need. What's that? Jesus. What about a cinema? <laughs> hey? A cinema? Yeah, cinema, yeah. Cinema in Rotherham, that's what you need. How many cinemas did we used to have? I don't know. We used to have five. Really? Yeah, but we've now got none. It's not what? Well, you'd, you'd like, would you go to the cinema in Rotherham instead of going to Madder? Well, Madder I would have, because I don't like Madder Hall anyway. Right. I think, it's a, I think it's a disaster waiting to happen, Madder Hall. It turned out Rotherham's the only town in South Yorkshire that doesn't have a cinema in its centre. Barnsley has an Odeon, Doncaster has an Odeon, and of course Sheffield has an Odeon too. So we took it upon ourselves to start a campaign, gathering almost a thousand signatures on a petition in about a fortnight. Even Rotherham's own MP, John Healy, signed it. I then went straight to London's Leicester Square and the head offices of Odeon, where I gave them the petition and asked them to consider bringing their business to Rotherham. They'd never even heard of Rotherham. But they explained to us that it was a tough time because something called a venture capitalist had just bought Odeon and they might not be developing anything for a while. Nonetheless, they said they'd get back to us and we waited patiently, hoping to bring the good news back to the people of Rotherham. The cinema at Small Mall Crystal Peaks closed its doors for good in the spring of 2003. The site for the premiere of Sheffield's most famous film, The Full Monty, the cinema was UCI's busiest in the country but after the Warner Brothers multiplex opened at Meadowall, it became one of the quietest. At the time I arrived, as I said, April 1991, Terminator 2 had just been released. I remember driving in and um, we had 2,000 free car parking spaces at the time. It wasn't enough. People were parking all over the grass just to see this film. I've never seen anything like it. Um, Yes, it was very busy, but UCI uh, in, in those days was the only multiplex cinema around. Uh, it wasn't long before the dome opened up Doncaster, which took away 
the Doncaster contingent because people mm. used to travel um, that far. I know because I, I live near Doncaster. Right. Um, and of course, uh, Meadow Hall uh, opened the Warner Cinema as well. Crystal Peaks is not the only area outside the city adversely affected by Meadow Hall, though. Hillsborough, best known as the home of Sheffield Wednesday, has seen many of its local businesses close over recent years. This is Richie Collins, brought in as the Town Development Officer for Hillsborough. This post has been created in, in a way to sort of support the local community. It's also about kind of trying to revitalise the shopping centre and hence sort of do something for the, for the local retailers and local business sector in this area. But the post came about through sort of local community consultation where from talking to people at sort of various events that have gone on in the area, there was sort of when he recognised that people liked having this shopping centre in, in the area. It's the, you know, it's the largest um, suburban shop, outdoor shopping centre in South Yorkshire, in Hillsborough. So it was really a, a you know, really sort of key local asset, but at the same time people felt there was a number of issues wrong, a number, sorry, a number of issues that weren't being addressed in the area, such as kind of lately economic sort of decline through sort of competition with Meadow Hall. And Sheffield Wednesday, meanwhile, struggling to survive after falling from the money-dominated Premiership, considered selling its Hillsborough training ground to Asda Walmart, a company that has consistently opposed unions, as well as paid women less than men. Local residents protested the store's proposed arrival, claiming the town had already lost enough small businesses. Um, when you actually look at the council figures for who was for it and who was against it, the vast majority of people in the Hillsborough area were against the development. Um, the figures that council produced they said that only 134 people were for the development and only 25% of them were from the Sheffield 6 area and most of them were from outside Sheffield some of them were from Norwich and Borough The fans were from other towns? Wow! Sheffield Wednesday really could be the next Manchester United especially as they printed glossy leaflets handed out on Saturdays persuading the thousands of fans to write to the council in support of the so-called Super Centre these were the anti-ASDA leaflets distributed by the local residents. Unbelievably, it was the campaigners who won. And it's just obviously we want to create local shops so people can get to the local shops on foot or by using public transport so you, they don't need to use a car. And if you build a big ASDA store you can guarantee that the smaller shops will close down and it forces that car dependency that the only shops left are large supermarkets and the only way you can get there is by car. Mm. So we were concerned about that as well. Right, so, so what happened in, like, towards the end? Uh, like, I mean, how can, you know, a group of residents from, from Hillsborough, uh, you know, win in a campaign like this? How did that happen? Well, I think some campaigns fail, fail because people don't get involved as a community and work together. Um, but. In this case, everyone in the community pulled together. There was huge amounts of people at the local meetings, and we all just took actions, such as some people did the petitions on a Saturday outside the co-op, some people wrote letters to councillors, some people went up to the other ASDA stores to see what impacts they'd found up there. And so everybody just took a few little jobs to do, and then we just had regular meetings just to keep informed about what was happening. So I think the key is that you can defeat these big companies if you all pull together as a local community and all just take a few small actions because you can't do everything yourself but if everybody just takes a little action then you can win. I think looking around at case studies and various examples there is evidence that large scale developments of supermarkets of this kind have a detrimental effect on the area overall in terms of job losses um, and the lack of money staying in the local economy. Because these large supermarkets, well the big four that dominate the food chain, they're all multinationals in a way, or very large companies that have headquarters and most of the profits go back to the headquarters. So although they might look like a good idea and they create jobs, they're mainly low paid, low skilled jobs. And they might only just be replacing the jobs that they've destroyed from the local shops. People still want local shops that they can go to to get, you know, various specialist items for instance or, or want to go down and uh, sit and have a coffee somewhere, somewhere near the, sit near the park and, and uh, have a cup.
coffee or a cake and wander through the park and sit with the kids and it's, it's things like that that are more in tune with sort of 21st century living. Rotherham's town centre has been losing existing businesses as well. Ten years ago, when House of Fraser announced the expansion of their Meadowhall store, they admitted that it would probably cost nearby Rotherham half a million pounds a year in trade. Sure enough, the town's stores began disappearing. These are just some of them. Okay, so it seems a pattern was forming here. Closing mines, bad. Opening meadow all, bad. And we wonder why we can't get over it. The, the people of Rotherham are very proud of the town. And it's, it's, it's made obvious by the fact of the number of local books we sell. And we really sell a lot of local books. Right. And people are always wanting to know about, even different areas, not just Rotherham itself, but Royal Marsh Maltby, they all want to know about Greensburg. And the people themselves are really proud of the town. And they, I think a lot of people feel let down by the way that the town is going, because it is a lovely town centre. If there were more shops here to attract people in, then, you know, it would be even better. It'd be, people hark back, people, the old people used to hark back, and they still do when they come in the shop, to what it used to be like in the 60s, the 70s, and all right, we can't go back to that, but surely we can move forward and find something new, something else to attract the people in. Yeah. What do you think that might be? I don't know. We've got the problems, or the, the, see the problems of, of, of Meadowhall on one side and Retail World on the other. Mm. Um, but if you see, a, if, you get a, if you get something, a problem in front of you, you either treat it as an obstruction or you treat it as an opportunity. You can either be negative about it or positive. You can go, oh, it's there, what can we do? Or you can say, that's what they do, what can we do that's different? Rotherham was in serious trouble, and those on high got desperate. The Rotherham Economic Partnership proposed using yield world facades to camouflage all the empty shops. Other ideas included boating on the nearby River Don, and the daily firing of a cannon. We have to um, hope um, that there will be some kind of initiative that isn't just a draft on a piece of paper somewhere in a council building, which we've been hearing about for as long as I can remember, but that some actual plans start coming to fruition. Um, I've also thought for a very long time that um, we need a hotel. I think it's absolutely vital that a, a town of the size of, of 250,000 doesn't have a hotel in the centre. It doesn't have a hotel either. Well, there are some good hotels on the outskirts yeah, and, and the in town, the southern. There is not a hotel in the town. So if you're a businessman coming to Rotherham and you're meeting overruns and you want to stay, you can't. No to stay. If you're having your wedding reception at this fantastic 500-year-old church and you invite people from out of town, what impression does it give of Rotherham if they can't actually stay in the town? You know, we haven't got enough quality restaurants. Now, if you're in the town after six o'clock at night, or you want a celebration meal to have an anniversary with uh, with the special person in your life, you've got literally a choice of about two restaurants in the centre of Rotherham. Yeah, there's McDonald's around the corner. Uh, that's one of the <laughs> no, but it's seriously that is the problem. Rotherham's council did have a vision for the future, though, the Rotherham Renaissance, where there'll be shiny buildings, sunshine, and rainbows, which apparently you can even walk on. I mean, it's all right having 
a renaissance plan for 25 years. Well, they're not going to be here in 25 years. They don't care about 25 years' time. It may or may not happen. From what I've seen from the plans, it looks like fantasy land rather than Rotherham, to be honest. And a lot of people say the same. What we need is something happening now in the next couple of years. Yeah. And a really dramatic, you know, something that will turn the town around and put right. it on the map. So it's um, it's less shoppers then now than it's ever. Less people. Less people. There, there comes a point when you look at your business and say, is there any more we can do? Right. And yes, we could have singing and dancing naked men and women in the windows, but if there's nobody walking past to see them, it actually doesn't matter. Yeah. And we've got to the stage now where you're always looking to improve what you do, but there's a limit now to what we can do to get more people in town. It's almost been taken out of our hands. Right, so whose hands do you think it is in now? Whoever is responsible for planning the future of this town, and it has to be the short-term future, because it's now gone on for so long that it won't have a long-term future if something isn't done in the short term. Mm. So I don't think it's a political issue, I think it's one of inertia. I've always thought that, that this is a town that stood there and thrown its hands up and said, there's nothing we can do, so we'll do nothing. But it's, it's coming up to Christmas, so I imagine you're expecting a lot of people coming in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, November the what seventeenth? Yeah, yeah. We should should be having the Christmas rush by now. Right, <laughs> it's not happening. This is it. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Everywhere else seemed to be heaving with shoppers, whilst Rotherham was relatively quiet. And while just up the road at Meadowall, they were having their Christmas lights switched on by Simon Cowell, Rotherham had to settle for Fred Wright and Natalie Warriner, the mayor and mayoress of Rotherham. Nonetheless, the people of the town did show up for the event and waited for an hour until Fred and Natalie started the tree lighting ceremony. Ten, nine, eight, seven, Unfortunately, the switch in Rotherham didn't work and the people had to wait a little longer for the lights. But at least it snowed. Happy Christmas, Sheffield! All in all, it was a fantastic evening, and if you weren't in the mood for Christmas before you arrived, you certainly were by the time you left for home. People don't, they say, uh, and we've been told um, not to be too negative about things, that we really ought to be positive. But when people come in the shop and say, it's terrible in Rotherham, are they these things that actually said to us, we don't say them, we don't, you know, right. we don't ask them what it's like, it's we're a volunteer. Yeah. Um, it's, there's nothing for me to come into town for. Um, then obviously it's, it's a worrying thing. And it's, it's definitely um, a downward slide. Um, and I can't see, even with all, we've got so many different plans apparently going on in the town, but I can't see any of them actually turning this around in the short term, and that's what we need. Recently though, it was announced that Rotherham had become a town on the move. Literally. When the Rotherham Chamber of Trade heard Tesco's proposals to extend its supermarket, they suggested luring town centre trade south, across the river, where it could join Tesco as an attraction. Rotherham's dependent hopes on major chain stores have rarely paid off with Dixon's, Halford's, Topshop, Mothercare, Jack Fulton, The Co-op, Next and BHS all having moved elsewhere relatively recently, a time when they were needed more than ever. But none of the departures were more embarrassing than that of Marks and Spencer. Just as Rotherham's town team unveiled plans to transform the town and attract businesses, Marks and Spencer announced the closure of their town centre store which had been a fixture since 1933. When councillors spoke of their frustration, Marks and Spencer said their decision was due to their plans to open another store outside the town centre at Parkgate Retail World. Hmm, things have changed quite a bit, because back in 1985, Marks and Spencer refused to move to out of town Parkgate, its retail world then in its infancy. Retail World was the idea of Stadium Group's Eddie Healy, who in 1985 came to Rotherham telling the council he was going to put a lot of money into building Europe's largest shopping mall right there on the land of former steelworks in South Yorkshire. The only thing was, he had only raised a quarter of the £100 million needed. This was because, in addition to Marks and Spencer refusing to come on board, another businessman, Paul Sykes, already had a similar idea over at Tinsley near Sheffield, also land where steelworks once stood. Sykes had difficulty developing Meadowall because of Healy's retail world, and so Healy called Sykes and suggested they both join forces, and a deal was made. 
Parkgate was frozen, and Meadowall was opened in 1990, becoming Europe's largest shopping mall. In 1999, Meadowall was sold to the company British Land, making both Paul Sykes and Eddie Healy an enormous amount of money. Sykes, the son of a miner, turned his back on his home's heritage and walked away with £400 million, leaving Sheffield, living in Harrogate and becoming a Conservative Party member. Healy got £700 million and the blueprint for similar malls, which he took with him abroad. I went with my Dutch colleague on the trail of this elusive businessman. If you tell me what time to get up, I'm gonna show you how it feels. If you try to keep me silent, I'm gonna shout for real. We're up and out there, we're taking our share. We're gonna wash out your shadow. This is Germany's Ruhr Valley. Like South Yorkshire, it was once a prominent steel and coal area. The Ruhr saw jobs cut from a total of 865,000 to just 178,000 jobs, a total loss of over half a million in barely over one generation. It's probably no coincidence then that by the 1980s the Ruhr was Germany's single most depressed area, with unemployment twice the national average. Then, Eddie Healy came over with his plans, seeking to capitalise on the desperation of the area and developing Centro, a shopping complex almost identical to Meadowall and again built on the site of former steelworks in Oberhausen. There's the Warner Village and the Warner Village. Whilst Meadowall has the Coca-Cola Oasis, Centro has the Coca-Cola Oasa. Spot the difference? Oasis, Oasa. Meadow Hall, Centro. You say Oasis, they say Oasa. Uncannily, the area also, like South Yorkshire, converted abandoned factories into museums, such as the Gasometer, which had literally no visitors when we went there. Near to Oberhausen is Bochum, Sheffield's twin town. There we found Dietmar Ossus, who, from this former coal mine, works to help people remember the area's heritage. Yeah, this is a, a kind of mining tower. So it was a, a, an over mine built up in 1858. And um, it was the first mine um, which belonged to Krupp, from the Krupp Stahlwerke Steelworks in Essen. So it's very important here. And here were a lot of inventions made for winding and so on. Right, so this, this area, uh, the, this entire district was uh, a big area for coal and steel. Wasn't yes, it? indeed, we are here in the center of the rural area, and uh, we had uh, um, from the 1850s on uh, mine to mine to mine, uh, like on the, on the stream. Right. Uh, there's a problem uh, for um, for the workless. We have a, a, a 
slightly kind of slum building in the uh, in the towns, towns for, um, mostly in the north northern areas here of the Ruhrgebiet. We have a lot of foreign workers, and they uh, have uh, really um, um, problems to get work because there are no workplaces for people who are not skilled. So, um, so you said like slums and things like that. Did that was there like an increase in crime and things like that, and poverty and people? There, there is a kind of uh, crime problem and poverty, but n not not in the mass, I think. Right, just a little bit. Yeah. Um, what was um, I noticed that they they said in some of the um, uh, pieces of publicity that I saw for this area that there uh, it's been given a boost because of Centro. Uh, what do you think about that? Okay, Oberhausen was uh, was uh, affected a lot by uh, by the turning down of the industry because they had a steelworks and mines too, and uh, they were closed down in a short time. And the city authorities of Oberhausen uh, thought about what to do now, and they decided to build up a, a huge uh, shopping mall, the Central. And the Central has a special effect to the town. On the one hand, the small old shops are all closed down, um, and the second effect is that the old uh, town centers, for instance, in the eastern rural area, this is like Dortmund and so on, they didn't uh, get um, uh, tourism, shopping tourism now, but because uh, everyone goes to overhousing, and so there's a, 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 a kind of increasing gap. In the, on the one hand, the richer get richer, and the poorer get poorer. So. It's been a bittersweet transition for the region now relying on a fickle tourism trade with its legacy of local industry remembered in a museum. And back over at Meadowall, deep inside, there lies a bronze statue of steelworkers reduced to barely more than an urban myth to the consumers around it, like Robin Hood. Sheffield recently controversially named its second nearby airport Robin Hood Airport because Robin Hood was actually from Sheffield the village of Loxley to be precise, and nearby Haversidge is home to the grave of Little John. Robin Hood robbed from the rich to give to the poor. Now in Sheffield, the opposite seems to be happening. Not far from Meadowhall, a casino is now being built, with help from New Labour's newly relaxed laws on such regional developments. Yep, they're stealing from the poor to give to the rich. Margaret Thatcher's talk of free enterprise was supposed to offer us freedom of choice, and it certainly seems like there's a lot of choice. But when we look closer, we realise there isn't. There are a lot of options, but little choice. For example, high street stores Evans, Wallace, Dorothy Perkins, Burton, Topman, Top Shop, and Miss Selfridge, who at first appear to be in healthy competition with one another, are actually all owned by the same company the Arcadia Group. Shopping seems to no longer be a means to an end, but a way of life. The people of South Yorkshire, still suffering in depression from the job losses of the 1980s, look to retail therapy as a quick fix, and this often leads to debt. Sheffield streets feature huge advertising boards and many for loan sharks. In Rotherham's town centre you can see several loan sharks and discount shops, a sign of the times for its people. Leslie Mundy is just one of many people who has found herself in debt. Um, I've been married for the last 15 years and uh, when we came into the marriage we both had financial problems from before we were married. Um, myself from my first marriage and my husband after his mother had died. Um, and really we never really recovered from that. Um, we then bought a house, but due to the crash with the house prices, we ended up with negative equity in it, uh, and it just went downhill from there. Um, what what happened then? Like, what did you do? At that point? Well, we uh, tried different financial options, but obviously by this time we'd got a bad credit score in, and, and we found it very difficult to get credit of any sort anywhere. Um, so uh, eventually, um, we found a company called. Can I, sorry, can I mention the company name? Yeah. 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 Right. We found a company called Greenwoods, um, and uh, they're a door-to-door -door collection service. And we lent some money off those because 
it coming up to Christmas and you know, wants a bit extra money. Um, we started off just lending a hundred pounds from them. Um, but it turned out that their rates were sixty pounds for every hundred you lent. Mm. So we were paying back hundred and sixty pounds for every hundred pound we lent from them. So how long were you doing that for? Uh, probably about three years. Right. Uh, we probably ended up lending about five hundred in all. Mm -hmm. uh, over the years, um, we got one loan for uh, like 300, but the interest rate was such that we were actually paying 480 back on the £300 loan that we got. Right, so did you find yourself sort of in a situation where you were getting loans to pay the loans? And yeah. And it just continued? And that? it just continues, yeah. Because right. yeah. I mean really, they're a, they're a very quick source of, of money if you need it. You know, which is obviously when you've got a bad credit score and you can't go anywhere else, then you know, if you need the money, you need the money. Yeah. At what point did you start thinking, hang on, this isn't necessarily a good thing? Uh, I would say after the second loan. Yeah. You know, we started realising that the, the amount we were paying back weekly was just, just getting silly, really. Yeah. Over six million families struggle with their debt repayments. The poorest people are the most affected, with over half of all households with serious debts on incomes of less than £8,000. Mortgage and rent arrears are the major causes of homelessness for thousands of households. Sheffield's development has seen many luxurious flats built, but sometimes at the expense of other blocks where poorer people lived. Residents of the Claywood Drive flats were bought off with £1,500 each to leave town so the buildings could be demolished. How far does a grand and a half go? How long does it last? What happened to these people? Where did they go? Yesterday's child is old Yesterday's child is cold She ran out of options again not in fashion anymore Yesterday's child is stuck Yesterday's child ran out of luck She's nowhere to be seen She is all Yesterday's child with child Yesterday's child is wild She's insult with injury She is the breast of full Monty Yesterday's Taurus don't see how Left out of the game Has an ASPO Slapped right across her Defiant face Yesterday's child Yesterday's child succumbed As Bernanadin the crack shows No ball 
ball games, no vote, no home. The last Big Sunday paper, right? And the, the and what they told us, right? That Sheffield Council or something to do with Sheffield was not admitting that there was anybody homeless in the city <laughs> at that time. There were no homeless people. What's this? Right. I'm talking to twenty twenty-five, and that's just homeless personal. people. Now yeah. I'm homeless. She's homeless. Yeah. And man, they, they would not admit to it. They were saying everybody in Sheffield were housed and there were no, it were all bullshit. That's a joke. There were nobody on the street. Yeah, because said, fix it wouldn't pay for one. That's all, the all one. All what's happening, that. That's the one. They just joke and they just lying to yeah, you and that. to get so drunk. saying that they go around the corner and that and get into the posh cars and that Porsche uh, and whatever. Yeah, all right, it's happening. If I had a Porsche, I'd sell it to get something to eat. To get some I mean? drugs. Yeah. They're telling me I've got to wait two years for a rehab. Right. So that's two years where I've got to put myself on the streets before they put me into a rehab to help me come they'd off. They'd send the you to jail within two seconds. Yeah. Why, why do you have to When you ask years? for help, they don't not give it you. Yeah. Them coppers are going to lock us up here. This because what I can't understand, yeah, is like Doncaster is a smaller know. place than Sheffield. Oh, yeah. Yeah, put this uh, they've got places either. where it's, it's like a convinced. six month wait. Oh, oh, they've oh, even got a night shelter where people can turn up and things like that, yeah. But Sheffield is a big city. And they haven't even got a night shelter. There's not even a night shelter. There's not even a night shelter in Sheffield. I've got our ears. Do you know why that why I've got our ears? Because back in ninety eight, I think it was my, my housing but even though I was I had a claim on that, yeah. I was on a training scheme trying to get learn a trade. Even though I was doing that, my housing benefits stopped getting paid. Even though the housing has admitted a lot of people stopped getting claimed, that's why they changed companies what were doing housing benefits. They did can you remember that dude a big like whatever you call it? It were on news and that one it. The mine stopped getting paid for about four to five weeks. So I was two hundred and no three three hundred and seventy nine pounds in the years. Right. And because of that, I did not know about it and because it was longer than fifty two weeks, I could not claim it back. So because of that, I could not even go through help desk to get a place over a weekend or whatever in cold weather when it was snowing and such. Yeah. Well at the end of the day with Thatcher's generation there was nothing for anybody to do. Everybody's turned to drugs or anything else because there was nothing to do. And she just messed it up completely, you know what I mean? You know the word conservative? Everybody went expecting a job straight away to go straight into mine and that. She screwed that up, so doing nothing for anybody to do. A lot of people turn to crime, whatever, you know what I mean? End of day, if I've got what I need, I don't want to take nothing yeah, else. Sure. Can I ask you, know you know something? Yes. Like, what are we going to do to change all this crap? You don't know, and I'm sick of hearing that question, yeah. uh, that answer. Yeah. What? I, nobody cares, man. Well, I, well, I, 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 I give one thing. People thing's... can't do nothing because, like, the people who can do something, they're the people who doesn't care. There's people who mm. cares, but they can't do nothing because they're not high enough to do things. But the government and things doesn't care. 
You know what I mean? Do you need they also told us about girls they knew who had prostituted themselves and even been assaulted by their pimps. You'd think with the Yorkshire Ripper murders being so infamous, people wouldn't put their safety at risk in this way. But for some, desperate times call for desperate measures. At the other side of the city, there's Spearmint Rhino, where the women there, though some say still being exploited, are working in safe conditions with regular pay. And the GMB recently helped set up a sex workers union. Back over at Meadowall though, it's not so privileged. Since the loss of employment in coal and steel in the 1980s, and the rise of retail business since then, women have begun to overtake men in employment. But unlike the jobs occupied by men, these jobs dominated by women are almost always part-time. This de-skilling and casualization mean retail workers, primarily women and young people, don't have much bargaining power and are vulnerable to unemployment, low wages and poor working conditions. The prominence of part-time work in the retail business is no accident. Part-time work benefits corporations in many ways because they save on national insurance contributions, overtime payments and staff training, as training and promotions are usually only available to full-time workers. In addition, part-time work means staggered working hours, which make organisation of workplace meetings difficult. When you look at it, it really doesn't seem like we've done much better for ourselves and it becomes difficult to convince people that South Yorkshire has moved on and can get over the loss of jobs in the coal and steel industries. What we found most strange about Meadowall was the fact that there weren't any clocks anywhere. Not one, other than those for sale in the stores. Meadowall was designed to be a prison if it failed. It didn't fail, it's thriving. But while the factories that once occupied this land provided us with resources and took care of their workers as well, Meadowall provides unstable, short-term, part-time jobs, mostly without a union, and sells expensive products people are struggling to afford. And the example of people working harder, having less money, spending more, and making Meadowall richer, has never been greater than at Christmas time. Plastic advice, blinking seduction from behind the glass, swallow Digest the reduction, consolidate, pay at last. Why not have a special mother and daughter day out? With 50% of all our latest fashion wear, you're bound to find the perfect purchase to give that unique mother-daughter bond that extra sparkle.
Until the fundamental causes of debt are changed, people are always going to find themselves in situations where they need access to credit. So some people in Rotherham are both challenging predatory lenders in our communities and building alternatives. Uh, credit unions are a financial cooperative, which means that people come together and save their money into a pool, and from that pool of money, um, low interest loans can be made to those members. That's it in a nutshell, really. Right. You said low interest. Um, uh, what kind of low interest are we, are we talking about? Uh, it's currently fixed at no more than 1% a month on the decreasing balance of the loan. So that means that somebody who borrows £100 and repays it over a year pays £6.50 in interest. So it's about as low as you can get, particularly for small amounts of money, which often the banks and the other lenders are unwilling to lend. But many people we interviewed in the street had never even heard of credit unions, and those that had weren't sure if they'd use them, even though they were getting ripped off by their bank. I think a major problem for um, this generation, maybe our generation as well to a certain extent, but certainly the younger generation, is that there, there hasn't been an awful lot of um, education, support and advice in managing finances effectively. Um, I think particularly for, for uh, young people leaving home for the first time. You know, the banks and the bigger financial institutions are only too happy to, you know, to get them on board, to offer them lots of credit, uh, overdrafts and so on. And uh, I think that's very beguiling for young people. And if they have a little discipline or the, uh, the experience in managing that, I think it's very easy for it to get to hand. Um, I think credit unions are particularly well placed to to start to do something about that because they're, they're based in local communities, they um, are on hand to, um, to, to talk to their members, to, to be closely connected with them, to help them through um, difficult, situ difficult financial situations, through their membership of the credit union, to, to show them that they can, um, they can save if efficiently and effectively but that they can also borrow safely and wisely. And I think that's really what credit unions are about. It's, it's, it's marrying up the two, the, um, the, the, the savings habit on the one hand and the sensible borrowing on the other. And I don't think many of the other financial institutions are particularly interested in that. They're, they're more interested in the amount of interest that they can charge on the borrowing um, and making the money. Well, credit unions also need to make money, but they, as, as I've explained, it's a low and fixed rate of interest, so people know exactly where they stand, um, and they can manage it because they can plan into the future with it. It's all, it's all geared towards, um, the, 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 the borrowing in particular, is geared towards only offering loans on the basis of what a member can afford, comfortably afford to repay. Um, so it's socially responsible lending that's at the root of it. And that is part and parcel of, of, um, of the educational process. Credit unions are about, one of their fundamental principles is about educating people in finances. And, uh, and that's what they're, part of what they're trying to do. So I think they've got a big, big um, part to play in helping people manage their finance, getting control of their finances themselves. Uh, I go to a, a class um, with a friend of mine. Um, Heather, who uh, works for the credit union, never heard of credit union before, and she came in and, and did a talk to the class about the credit union in Lothra, mm -hmm. um, and just took some information home, and had a read through it, thought, you know, 
Well, it sounds all right, but you know, <laughs> what is it exactly? Um, and that's how I found out about it. She just gave me some information around it. Right. I had a read. What did you think of it once you've read about it? Uh, my first reaction was, is it true? Because, I mean, like, you get a £100 loan from the credit union, you're paying £3.78 back, or roughly that. Um, you get a £100 loan from Greenwood, you're paying £60 a loan back. It's, you know, I thought it just seems a bit too good to be true. Right. So you thought, you know, is it is it legit or what's the catch? Or yeah. yeah. And, and what, what kind of... Um, you your suspicions about that, wouldn't you? Well, I just had a, I just had a talk to Heather about it. And of course, the fact that it said credit in it, my first reaction was, right. there's no point trying for it because we'll not get it anyway. <laughs> right. It was my first reaction out. because, yeah, it is called the credit union. But yeah, I, I, had a, I actually came into the office and I had a chat with Heather about it. And um, we worked through, she showed me some figures um, of, theirs, of their sort of rates compared with other companies. And uh, I thought, yeah, we'll go for this. It's, it's really good. Okay. So what what happened then? Like you said earlier, that you're in that sort of cycle of you know the debt. How did the credit union help you with that? Well, the first thing is that you not you've not got to put a load of money into it. You can put in whatever you can afford every week. Um, but it's the encouraging you to do it every week. Um, and because we do it on a weekly basis. Uh, and we, we put money in, we're actually starting to save, which is something that we've never ever done before in 15 years. Um, so we've got that, so we've now got savings, so that's a help. Um, it's also helped us in that, I mean I've been saving with the credit union for over a year now, so we've got savings, um, it's there the same as any other loan company is if you need help with cash. My car conked out the end of last year, um, so I got a, a loan from the credit union to get um, another car. So it's given me that, um, and I'm going abroad next year hopefully. So we're saving to be able to go abroad as well. It's helped us in a lot of ways. You know, these sorts of things I would never have thought about sort of two years ago. I would never even have considered like a holiday like that or being able to get a new car. Because it, it, it's, it's a fact that um, people with the least money are paying the highest rates for the, for the privilege of credit. And that doesn't strike us as uh, very fair or reasonable when we want to do something about it. It seems we've been taught to trust brand names and trust the well-known companies, all the while being told in the press that foreigners are coming over here and taking our jobs. Well, thanks to companies like HSBC, People don't have to come to our country to take our jobs, because HSBC, who happened to be the fourth largest employer in Sheffield, recently announced they were firing thousands of employees here in Britain, many of them in Sheffield, to open call centres abroad and pay people on the cheap, in spite of the fact they'd been making record profits of billions of pounds. I decided to go and visit their head office in Sheffield. Sorry, we're just making a documentary about. Um, uh, we're not gonna. She's she's Dutch. She doesn't know. Uh, Vilnius, drop you. Hello. I'm just need at the moment on the fire. She's in Paris. We're making a documentary about the. Uh, but it's in weather. You know, the job loss in Sheffield. Oh, can you come down and talk about it? Oh, uh, you know the because there's like lots of. Job codes and yeah, others. I mean, so it's been a really good year for Brian. Um, she doesn't really know what I'm She's Dutch. I don't know, my Dutch is really shaky, so I don't really know. Well, just ask her. No. Cut. Do you know what I'm saying? Cut. Thank you very much. I'll drop it to her tonight. Cut. 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 Oh, it's public property. Oh, it's, it's public property. Okay. This is public okay. property. Okay. 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 Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's all coming down. down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go on. They saw you. Yeah. 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 Ye
Would you mind? That's cool. Would you mind? Are they going to? Would you mind switching that off? Is it? Excuse me. You can understand me. Would you mind switching that off? We're not here to like rob HSBC. I just want to talk to them from the office. You have to make a. What's 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 your request? Yeah, I do. I'm just enjoying this. Cool. Yeah. What do you think about okay. the job yeah. Yeah. Have you? 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 Oh, right, okay. I'm not, I don't want to do that or anything. I just want to, just want to see how people, how they can excuse, like, making 5.14 billion pounds profit and yet making job layoffs. You're not going to lose your job, are you? Are you worried about it? I know you're just doing your job now, I don't want to get you into trouble or anything, but... No, that's, that's what I'm paid for. Right. What, to get... To, for, no, I'm, I'm paid for doing my job, and that's it. Right, but you, you might be... Would you mind switching it off? Okay, would you talk to us off the record at some point? Not, not at all. No one's going to come down and talk about it. We will not talk to you now. There are, there are ways of means, and this is not the way to do it. Okay, can I... What are the ways of means? What can I do? <laughs> you want to approach... Uh, we'll, uh, yeah. Um... I'm not quite sure, to be honest. Because uh, I'll just do that, you know, it's cool. Uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, Sheffield Council's own reports concede that corporations are far more vulnerable to closures than small businesses. And even in times of national recovery, over half of the corporations in the city reported cuts. I figured that even if the council were going to accept this, I myself didn't have to. I went to HSBC and told them I wanted to close my account. But, because I had a credit card with them and so owed them money, I wasn't able to do that. So I went to our friends at the credit union and set up an account with them, which allowed me to pay off my credit card debt and free myself from HSBC forever. Aside from my own troubles, Rotherham, of course, was still waiting for its cinema. London never came calling. And so we simply stayed at home, in Rotherham, and helped the campaign to save an old cinema house. Failing that, we'd go around the town's pubs, clubs and community centres and screen it ourselves. It's funny, whether it be the industries that built our communities, gave us resources, work and unions, or the groups who help us recover from poverty and debt, or the thousands of people fighting for a cinema, the solutions to our problems often seem to be found in our own backyard, from our own neighbours and their strength and skills. We seem to have been led to put our trust in big business and brand names when time and again they've betrayed it and betrayed us. Yet still we entrust our very livelihoods to them time and again. And so here, now, the smoke's cleared and the dust has settled and there is only one thing left for us to do. Get over it. Hear me friends, let me sing you a song When the coal veins ran deep and fed many Oh, yeah, well, not the people in Sheffield. Well, he's, um, he's, 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 I didn't buy it. Oh, yeah. Not, no, it's not. I'm going to go and fetch my car now, and then by the time I get my car now, he's going to be just fine. Will he be able to bring his car as well? Maybe more. The blood's red and tears. We get out. That greed fueled poison. The wages were cut, the snap time was bled. The mine shafts and steelwork stopped clanking. With blood, sweat, and tears, we get over it, get over it. Hand out some painkillers, we get over it. Stronger. 
Yes, it does it. To stop the sleeping. I never watched the language, Oz. It's going to be like Osborne. Bleep, 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 bleep. You're not going to be able to listen to anything that's there. Well, once I taught the stands at Tallest Museum, the frameworks there for repentance. Well, we sang and laughed, stands a fast food store. Our sons leave this town and get riddance. Blood, sweat and tears We get over it Get over it Hand out some painkillers We get over it Get over it Why can't we get over it? Exactly. Only the British can do that. Yeah. Refuse to learn Everywhere. the language.